Today, we're gonna transform this shapeless chunk of modeling clay into this fully functional, organic looking, and perfectly fitted to your hand and closure for the radio transmitter. To be honest, this RC transmitter is just an excuse for me to talk about designing this kind of natural looking enclosure for any device. Seriously, any device would do. Be it computer mouse, a gamepad, or maybe something wearable. I needed such an unref 24 l chip based controller for my next project. So I'm gonna use it as an example to tell you how you can create something like that yourself. And because I don't like to be theoretical, I'll demonstrate the whole process to you step by step on this actual device. All the software we're gonna use today is free of charge, so all you need is a camera, the one on the front will do, a PC and access to a 3D printer. I also assume that you're gonna be able to install all the necessary software yourself without my help. I've put the links to all of it in the description. However, if you need my help, let me know in the comment section, or if you prefer, write me an email. And one last thing before we get started. This topic is quite extensive, so I decided to divide it into two parts. In the first part, this one, we're gonna create the case itself. In the second one, we'll do everything else. The schematic, PCB and all the mechanical elements. Okay, there's a lot to cover, so let's get started. The keyword for today is photogrammetry. It's a method of creating 3D models of physical objects from photographic images. This isn't a new technology. In fact, it's pretty old. The first documented use dates back to year 1858. I guess it was some building in Paris. If you search the internet today, you would find plenty of articles and videos about photogrammetry. Technology has progressed so much in the last few years that nowadays you can do it yourself at home without having to have a computer from NASA. Most people, however, use the photogrammetry to model statues, rocks, trees or themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. I've started using it by creating a model of an old tombstone that I found not far from where I live. And it turned out really nice. But otherwise it's actually quite useless. What can I do about it, other than show my friends what a superb model I made? Not much. Then I came up with really neat idea that I could use this technique to design an enclosure for my RC transmitter. Instead of modeling a solid in an ordinary, 100% digital way, I can use modeling clay and then using photogrammetry transfer it into a computer. This is much easier and faster way to mold this perfectly fitted to my hand enclosure. And also, it's gonna look awesome as hell. Step 1. Sketch a preliminary model on a piece of paper. Before we even get started, you need to make sure that you have at least a general idea of what it is you wanna do. Just put it on a piece of paper. And seriously, don't skip this step. You'll thank me later. This is a good moment to consider what you really want from your device, what functions should it have and what components it must contain. In my case, it's gonna be a joystick, two potentiometers for acceleration and calibration and a battery box. The bigger components are the most important because you have to estimate how much space you need. The smaller ones should fit in between. Step 2. Create these components in Fusion 360. Create a new project in Fusion 360 and add to it all the components you defined in the previous step. Now, it would be good if you knew exactly what components you want to use. You can check your favorite electronics store to see what is available and what best suits your project. If you are going to use commonly used elements, you might find them ready-made models on grabcat.com. If not, you might need to draw them by yourself. Step 3. Arrange these components in Fusion 360 workspace. Following your paper sketch, place the components more or less where you want them to be on your device. I'm gonna place the joystick somewhere in the front for easy access with my thumb, the first potentiometer around here and the second one on the back of the device because I'm not gonna use it frequently and the battery box somewhere in the middle. You don't have to do it precisely. The exact position you'll determine later. Step 4. Draw a simple box around all the components. And close all the components in the super simple box. 
it'll ensure enough space for everything you want to fit inside after creating the enclosure. Step 5. Print that box. Print this box out or have someone else print it for you. This box will be core or spine of your clay model. Step 6. Design your enclosure from modeling clay. This is the weirdest step, especially for tech guys like you and I. Take the modeling clay, it doesn't matter what kind, generally the cheaper the better, and mold it around the printed box. Take your time, make sure everything fits and looks the way you want it to. I needed an hour for this, but if you are more artistically inclined than I am, it will probably take you less time. Step 7. Add some texture. Photogrammetry doesn't like smooth and uniform objects, so you need to add some texture to it. I've tried different approaches from mixing a modeling clay with a sawdust to spraying it with a colored paint, and by far the easiest way to do this is to use a marker. And of course, as you may have guessed, the color of the marker should differ from the color of the clay. Go crazy with the dots and dashes. Step 8. Optional. Take a white sheet of paper on which you put your model. On this white sheet, just like on the model, you need to add some kind of texture. Such lines will be perfect. This piece of paper has three functions. It has pattern that will make it easier to calculate the position of the camera. It reflects the light, illuminating the model from below. It has a known dimension, so it will make it easier to scale the model afterwards. Step 9. Put the model on the easily accessible place. You should take a lot of photos on each side of the model. Therefore, it should be placed somewhere where there is enough space around. You can put it a little higher, so you have better access from below. A stool in the center of the room would be a good choice but use whatever you had at hand. I'll use an old lamp stand with a piece of board instead of a lamp. Speaking of which, step 10. Provide good lighting. This is the most crucial element. Without proper light, you won't get good, if any, results. The light should be soft, uniform and constant when taking the photos. The outdoors on a cloudy day provides the best lighting for photogrammetry. But if that's not option for you, don't worry. You can do it at home as well. If that's the case, use more than one source of light. You can also put a white piece of fabric between the model and the lamp. It will nicely diffuse the light. You can also reflect the light of the wall or ceiling, which will increase the surface area and thus will also soften the light. Make sure that you don't cast a shadow on the model yourself as you walk around and take pictures. Step 11. Provide good environment and it comes down to leaving your room messy, meaning the more things are in the background, the better. Single color walls with no reference point will make the photogrammetry process very difficult. The second thing is that the position of the background items should be fixed. Pay attention to this, especially if you are taking the photos outside on a windy day. Step 12. Set the camera to the manual mode. A mid-range smartphone like this Galaxy S6 is enough to follow these steps. But if you have DSLR or mirrorless camera, that's even better. Since I don't have a, such a fancy gear, I lose my smartphone. Continuing the topic from the previous steps, you need to keep the condition as stable as possible. So what if you provided the perfect lighting and environment when your camera changes the exposure between shots? It also could ruin the results. That's why you should be able to access the manual mode of your camera. If the app on your phone doesn't allow you to do this, you can always install another one. The most important thing is to fix the exposure and the white balance. Set some values before the first pictures and lock them out. Step 13. Take about 50 photos of your model. In theory, the more photos you take, the better. However, it will extend the already long process of creating the mesh model. I've tried different options, from 20 to over 300 photos, and taking 50-60 shots seems to be most reasonable. 
increasing this number won't significantly improve the quality. Additionally, if you want to speed things up, you can reduce the resolution to full HD. It is enough. Ok, but how should you take these photos? Make about 3 runs around your model, taking a shot frequently, and hold the camera higher with each round. The general rule is that each photo should overlap around 70% of the previous one, but don't take it very seriously. If you have a model similar size as mine, take 50-25 photos per lap. It should be enough. Step 14. Make sure that all photos are ok. Before proceeding, make sure that the photos you took are ok. All images should be sharp focused and similar to each other. If any photo stands out, delete it. Better fewer photos of good quality than more bad ones. Step 15. Upload all photos to Meshroom. This is the most important piece of software in this video. It will create mesh model from your photos. To add photos to your project, just drag and drop them or go to File, Import Images. Step 16. Add information about your camera's sensor size, if needed. Meshroom needs hardware information about the camera to do the calculations correctly. If you see a green circle next to the photo, you can skip this step. This means that all the necessary information is contained in the photos file. If it's yellow, it means that some information is missing. In most cases, it will be size of the camera sensor. Meshroom will try to estimate this value, but most likely it won't get it right. Therefore, I recommend adding it manually. To do this, you need to find out what sensor size your camera has. The easiest way to do this is to search the internet or install the application like Detect My Hardware. Then go to Camera Sensor DB file in Meshroom catalog and add your device. I added my Samsung SMG... whatever. Reset Meshroom. If everything went well, you should see green circles now. Step 17. Start calculating. While it might seem tempting to click the big green button on the top, don't do it. Trust me, especially at the beginning of your adventure with photogrammetry. Instead, go to the notes below. If they seem complicated to you, then you couldn't be more right. There's a lot, a lot of options here. Fortunately, the default settings are sufficient in most cases and you don't need to change anything. Go to the Structure from Motion node, click right and then compute. Step 18. Wait. Since you have break anyway, click the like button if you find my video useful. Thanks. Step 19. Evaluate the initial results. Up to this point, the process has been relatively fast, and if something has gone wrong, you should be able to see it. In the 3D viewer, you're gonna see the initial effect of your scan and all the camera positions. If something looks wrong at this stage, stop the process. It would be a waste of time. It's better to make sure that everything is ok with the photos you've uploaded. On the other hand, if everything seems ok, you can continue. Right click on the texturing node and compute. Step 20. Wait some more. Or even better, go out for lunch. Step 21. Optional. Clean and repair the mesh file in the mesh mixer. This is an optional but highly recommended step. The generated mesh could have a couple million of faces and Fusion 360 doesn't like such a big objects. That's why I recommend using Mesh Mixer first. It is also Autodesk software and it's completely free. In Mesh Mixer, you can clean, repair and smooth your mesh. You can do a lot more, but the rest will be more convenient to do in Fusion. I know the texture look weird and honestly I have no idea why, but it doesn't matter anyway. The first step is the turning them off completely. Then cut out all the rubbish around the model. Leave a sheet of paper. You're gonna need it to scale the model. Now you can perfectly see all the imperfection of the mesh. But don't worry, it's fixable. And I'm gonna show you how simple it is. Start by turning on the wireframe. Now you can see how many faces your model has. And there's a lot, isn't it? From the menu on the left, find Select button. Adjust the brush size to your needs. Mark the defect and the little around it. 
and delete it. Now from the menu select Edit, Erase and Fill, tweak the scale and barge settings to match the way the hole is filled. When you are satisfied, click Accept. Repeat these steps for all defects in your model. It can be a bit of work, but it's worth of your effort. The final model will look awesome. As a final touch, you can globally smooth the entire model. Go to the Select button again, double click on the model to select all. From the menu select Deform, Smooth, play around with the settings and click Accept when you are satisfied. And here's the model in all its glory. Step 22. Import the mesh file into Fusion 360. To import a mesh into Fusion 360, create a new document. If you want, you can use the file you've already created. However, to modify mesh, you need to disable Design Capture History, which is super helpful in the classic design method. So after creating new document, right-click on the project name and find Do not capture design history and click it. Then go to Preferences, Preview Features, and make sure that the Mesh Workspace checkbox is selected. Now you should see that the Mesh tab has appeared. But before you go there, import your fixed and smoother model. Insert, Insert Mesh. Step 23. Scale and transform mesh to solid. Now you can go to the mesh workspace. Before you convert this mesh to a wrap, a solid body, you should do three things. Reduce the number of faces. The more you reduce, the less detail the model will have. The upper limit allowed by Fusion is around 50k, but I made it a lot smaller anyway because my computer isn't the newest anymore. Scale it to actual dimension. This is exactly why you used a sheet of paper under a clay model. If you ensure that the sheet will have right size, the rest of the model will be ok as well. Cut off the part you no longer need using the Plane Cut tool. As a fill type, select Minimal. Thanks to this, you will get an almost flat surface, which is helpful to print that model. And last but not least, orient the model well in space. Think how long it would have taken if you had wanted to design it in a classic way. Of course, assuming that's even feasible. Let me know in the comments what enclosure you would or you will design using this modeling clay technique. I'm very curious. On my website is a text version of this guide. If you prefer text instead of video, you can find the link below. In the next video, we're gonna design the buttons, the trigger, pack all the electronics inside and program the microcontroller. So if you don't want to miss it out, subscribe to my channel.